Okay, now I'll introduce you to our study system. What you're looking at here is a portrait of a male and female guppy taken in their natural environment. The male's in the upper left and the female's in the lower right. Now, what you can see here is that males and females are very different from one another, as is true of many organisms. In this case, the males are brightly colored, whereas the females are a uniform, dull color pattern. In fact, if you look at them under a microscope, they're virtually transparent. The males tend to be smaller than females. They're about a half to three quarters of an inch long, or 15 millimeters, depending on whether you think about English or metric units of length. Females can often be on the order of 20 to 25 millimeters long. And the reason we see this difference is that males stop growing when they attain sexual maturity, while females continue to grow throughout their lives. But the other point is that they're small fish, and that, that'll be an important point later on. Another interesting feature of guppies is that they're live bearers, and that they have short generation times. A female guppy will give birth to her first litter of young when she's about 10 weeks old, and then will give birth to a new litter of young about every three to four weeks thereafter, and they reproduce throughout their lives. The baby guppies are very much like miniature adult guppies, which means that we can keep them in the laboratory under the same sorts of conditions as we would adults, and that the probability of survival from birth to adulthood is nearly 100%. Now, all these facts together tell you one of the things that's nice about guppies. They're great for laboratory research. They're small. You can house a lot of them in a relatively small space, and they have a short generation time. They breed rapidly and they produce many hardy babies. And so the babies are easy to work with in the laboratory. Now in the field, the place where I do my research is on the island of Trinidad, which is like a chip off of the northeastern shoulder of South America. And in fact, at times in the past, Trinidad has been part of mainland South America. And what that means is that the animals and plants that we find there are a subset of what you would see on the mainland. Trinidad is relatively close to the equator and as a consequence, it's a tropical environment. The place where we do our research is in the seasonal tropical rainforests that are found in the Northern Range Mountains. And what you're looking at here is one of my favorite places to, in which I do my research. I make no secret of the fact that one of my motives for studying guppies is that I wanted them to be my ticket to the tropics. I grew up longing to spend time in the tropics while living in New York City and learning about the tropics, sitting in my den while ice built up on the window, watching specials produced by companies or organizations like the National Geographic. And so starting at a very early age, I decided I want to go to these places and spend time there. And guppies have proven to be my ticket to the tropics for about 30 to about the past 30 years. Now, the Northern Range Mountains get on the order of three to four meters of rain per year, which means that they're well supplied with streams and rivers that flow throughout the year. And these are the sites where we find guppies. This is one of the larger rivers where guppies can be found. Um, but many of the rivers that we work on are actually considerably smaller than this. The reason I'm interested in streams in Trinidad is because there are differences among communities, uh, uh, communities of guppies and the kinds of predators that they live with. And I've elected to study what I refer to as high versus low predation environments. In high predation environments, guppies live with a diversity of predators that like to eat guppies. And in low predation environments, which are found in the same river systems, guppies live with only a single species of predator that occasionally will eat guppies. What you're looking at here are some samples of the predators that guppies co-occur with. The slides on the left and the one on the upper right are representatives of fish that are found in high predation environments. The upper left is a photograph of some cichlids and a guppy in a 10-gallon tank with one of these fish has a half-life of less than a second. It turns out that in nature, guppies are very good at evading these predators so that large fish like this can expect to eat, we think, on the order of a half a guppy to a guppy a day. But what we found is that even this level of predation is sufficient for them to have a profound effect on guppy evolution. The fish that's pictured in the lower right-hand panel is the only fish that co-occurs with guppies in low predation environments. This is a killifish in the genus Rivulus, and it's an omnivore. It will eat most anything that it can swallow, but it will occasionally eat guppies, and when it does, it eats mostly small size classes of guppies. Now, what you're looking at here is a schematic of the northern part of the island of Trinidad, and the Northern Range Mountains has a crest line that runs on an east-west axis, and what we see then are rivers that flow either to the north on the north slope of the Northern Range Mountains or to the south on the south slope of the Northern Range Mountains. And what I've done is to, to color code the types of fish communities that are found there. 
On the south slope, the high predation communities are coated in red and the low predation communities in blue. On the north slope, high predation is in yellow and low predation is green. The reason I use different colors is because the suite of predators turns out to be entirely different on the north versus the south slopes, uh, which is an interesting story in itself, but it's not one that I'll be talking about today. The important point to you is that what you can see is that there are many rivers running parallel to one another, and in every one of them we see replicated the difference between high and low predation environments. So that means that as a scientist, when I go to study the effects of predators on guppies in nature, I have many different populations to choose from. And because this gives me the ability to evaluate the generality of the influence of predators on guppies. Now, one of the interesting features about these rivers is that they're punctuated with waterfalls. What the Northern Range Mountains are, are a relatively young range of mountains that was uplifted by the collision of two tectonic plates. And when we have newly uplifted mountains in the presence of high rainfall, what you get is erosion. And so the rivers that we study run through remarkably steep ravines and they're punctuated by waterfalls. And the waterfalls, like the one that you're looking at right here, often represent barriers to the upstream dispersals of fish. And so what we see in many of our river drainages are that immediately below a waterfall like this one, you can find guppies in a high predation community, and immediately above the waterfall, you can find guppies in a low predation community because the waterfall has served as a barrier to the upstream dispersal of the predators. It turns out that guppies and the killifish are much better at dispersing upstream than are the, the larger predators. And so what this means then is that we often can find guppies in very similar environments that are only tens of meters apart but living with very different suites of predators. And that, again, is a very powerful tool for looking at the effects of predators on how guppies adapt to their environment, how they adapt to the risk of predation. Now, my work has focused primarily on the evolution of guppy life histories. And by life history, what I mean are all the components of the animal that contribute to how it propagates itself. And the most important ones are the age at maturity, how often it has babies, and how it allocates resources to babies, how many and how large the offspring are, and how often they, they reproduce. 